I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Matthew Sadagas to review the first dark matter search results from the Lux Zeppelin experiment. Dr. Sadagas received his BA, MS, and PhD from the University of Chicago in 2005, 6, and 11, respectively, then continued his work in physics as a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Davis. He's an associate professor with tenure at the University of Albany Department of Physics, pursuing experimental particle astrophysics, in particular, the direct laboratory detection of dark matter and general detector development for rare event searches. So Matthew, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is kind of a big day because we're talking about the first dark matter search results from the LZ detector. But before we get into the results, let me start by asking you for kind of a layperson's description of what dark matter is. Sure, so it's a, a theoretical form of matter that we are fairly certain exists because of observational evidence from astronomy and cosmology. So when we look out in space and we attempt to calculate how much mass and energy there is in the universe, it seems like there's more than there should be. Um, there's more than there's shining within stars and, and, and galaxies. And that it, it seems like there's a lot more matter that isn't visible and doesn't interact except through gravitational forces. In the past, there's been some debate over whether or not dark matter actually exists. It's been kind of considered controversial. Has that debate been settled in favor of it or is there still kind of a disagreement in science about it? Um, well, it's been, it's in the, in the scientific community, it's really been, I'd say a few decades since it's actually been uh, controversial. And the reason is, is because even though we don't have direct evidence, the observational evidence from astronomy has really, really piled up a great deal to the point where it's really hard to, to wiggle out of there being dark matter. We now have something like seven or eight independent pieces of evidence from astronomy and cosmology that say there's really something there. Um, I can give you a couple examples. So the, the a traditional, one of the like earlier pieces of evidence for dark matter was the, uh, was the speed of revolution of stars around centers of galaxies, the so-called galactic rotation curves. Now those things can be explained away by modifying gravity. And that's where some of the controversy was, is one could argue it's simpler to explain those away, but that was 1979, it's 2022 now. So if you just pick the first piece of evidence of dark matter, oh yeah, you could. You don't need dark matter to explain that, you could do with modified gravity, but mod modifying the theory of gravity fails miserably at explaining the other seven, eight pieces of evidence, things like a gravitational lensing, cosmic microwave background radiation, large scale structure, the list goes on and on and on and on. And in fact, just a couple of years ago, we discovered galaxies that seem to have no dark matter or be almost entirely made of dark matter. And how do you explain that if there's no dark matter? If instead you have to modify gravity, a, a theory that has no dark matter has no way of explaining those observations. But if dark matter is actually stuff, then it makes sense that some galaxies will have more of that stuff and some galaxies will have less of that stuff. So despite not being able to identify it, like in the laboratory as a specific particle, we have mountains of evidence, indirect evidence from astronomy and cosmology that just keeps piling, piling up and piling up and piling up and keep getting confirmed and reconfirmed and reconfirmed. Well, you know, one of the things that interested me when I was reading the paper, so that the paper is the first dark matter search results from the Lux Zeppelin LZ experiment, right? And the first thing I noticed, this to me, this was just amazing, how many contributing scientists are listed on it. There appear to be well over 100, it could have been close to 200 scientists from a couple of dozen different universities. I mean, just the list just went on and on and on. So can you tell me about the size and scope and interest in this project? Yeah, this is really, you're, you're gonna be maybe surprised. This is actually a small experiment for high energy physics. So experiments like ATLAS and CMS at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, they, I believe that ATLAS and CMS each have 3,000 
uh, collaborators. So you can imagine that author list goes on for a long time. So in high energy physics, a dark matter experiment like LZ, despite its size, you said it's about, I believe, 250, maybe closer to 300 actually authors on the first paper. That's considered a small scale experiment. But the reason why you still need that many people, hundreds of people, because you need um, you need a, a faculty, so you need professors, you need scientists at national labs, you need uh, postdocs, postdoctoral scholars, you need graduate students, you know, you need PhD students, you need engineers, technicians, you need all those people working together harmoniously in a collaboration on different aspects of such a large scale project. So you need that many people because you can't accomplish that level of science with a small number of people. So at the different people on the team all bring different talents and a different skill set to the table that makes an experiment like this possible. Okay, okay. Well, and I think that also offers additional validation. This is not just a couple of guys working in a lab. This is not somebody at a blackboard writing down equations and saying, look, everybody, this is how it should be. This is big. This is a massive project. And like you've said, it, in, a, in a weird sort of way, it's small for large physics, but still, right. you said 250, 300 participants, right. I guess. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of folks. Yeah. So I, I think one of the reasons that people, many people have difficulty accepting dark matter is because it rarely interacts with normal matter. And, you know, when I thought about that, be, being a lay person myself, I thought, well, neutrinos are like that and they're pretty well accepted. So do you think it's, it's just kind of a matter of time before dark matter is, is accepted as normal, a normal part of the universe? Absolutely. The neutrino is an excellent analogy because before we actually discuss Find, conclusively, you know, discovered the neutrino, which I believe was 1950s. Actually, it didn't take long to to do after it was first um, hypothesized by Enrico Fermi. The it, it's very analogous to dark matter because it interacts very rarely. So the way neutrinos were discovered, despite interacting rarely, is we we figured out nuclear reactions that can produce neutrinos and also how to create high flux sources. So if something interacts very rarely, how do you detect it? You make a lot of them, right? And so now we use neutrinos, you know, on a on a, on a regular basis, and there are dozens, if not more than that, you know, neutrino experiments that are studying the neutrino further. So now, so over the past few decades, there have been numerous Nobel prizes awarded for discovering different properties of the neutrino because we found it, but then we weren't done because then we're trying to figure out well, what are the properties of the neutrino. With dark matter, we still haven't gone to that first, you know, we have the we have we have the the indirect evidence just like there was for neutrinos initially there was indirect evidence from nuclear reactions there was missing energy so actually in more ways than one the neutrino is actually a really good analogy because not only does it interact very rarely but the what pointed us towards the neutrino was missing energy in reactions so not in outer space not with gravity but there were missing reactions missing energy in in nuclear reactions that pointed towards the neutrino because either we either there was a new particle or conservation of energy doesn't work and you know we know conservation of energy doesn't work it's one of the main reasons you can't make you know like a perpetual motion machine for example and so it was either conservation of energy was wrong or there's a new particle well turns out there, there was a new particle but dark matter is more difficult than the neutrino because we don't know how to make it um, we can try like in particle colliders, that's not the approach we have in LZ where we're just trying to detect it from, from space or from all around us. But the problem, yeah, the problem with dark matter is we're trying to detect a signal from nature. Whereas with neutrinos, they don't just only exist in nature, you can make them on purpose artificially. And we're not sure we can do that with dark matter, we're trying, but the most of the dark matter searches are geared towards just finding it in nature. And we don't know then, well, then how common is it in nature? And that's part of the problem with trying to detect it is we're at the mercy of the natural source of dark matter. Oh, okay. Well, so if it barely interacts, what is the strategy that's used to detect it? And how does the LZ detector do that? So it, it, when we talk about it inter, barely interacting, we should clarify that means non-gravitationally because gravitationally it appears to interact a lot. It appears to interact, interact gra gravitationally just like normal matter. 
And, and so when we say it interacts barely or rarely, that is non-gravitational. Okay. So we're not sure what that non-gravitational interaction could be. It depends on what dark matter is. So an experiment like LZ, you can think of it as at a simple level. It's like a billiard ball collision. We want dark matter to hit a nucleus inside of one of the atoms in our detector. And it might not, right? It's entirely possible. Dark matter only interacts gravitationally. But a lot of the models we have for dark matter predict that dark matter should interact mostly gravitationally, but it might also have an interaction with a nucleus of different atoms. And you might be able to detect it that way. Okay, well, that's the rare event searches, right? And that's a part of your your role and your specialization. And I know yes. neutrinos the same way, right? They they very rarely interact, but when they do, this it's one of these rare events. And it sounds like dark matter is the same thing. Where exactly. and, and my apologies. So gravitationally, it's interacting in terms of actual particles, where like it hits a nucle, nu, nucleus. That's more rare, but it does happen, and that's the rare events that you're searching for. Exactly. Now, there's in real in reality, there's no such thing as a collision because a collision means some sort of particle has to be exchanged. So even if I knock, you know, two balls, two balls together, why do they bounce off of each other? It's because the electrons in the outermost shells and the outermost atoms. So the reason it will repel each other. So the reason why my hand can't go through this table, even though matter is mostly empty space, like 99.9999999% empty space is because the electrons repel. And okay. so that's an electrical repulsion. So when, when I say dark matter would hit a nucleus, there's no such thing as hit. So what that really means is there would be some sort of, some sort of force, non-gravitational force exchange. What that would be, I mean, it could be a Higgs boson. It could be something else. We don't know. Some new force, some other new particle. But what I mean by collision is, so dark matter goes go past the nucleus and there's some sort of like, messenger particle for some sort of force that's exchanged that pushes the nucleus so that's okay. what a collision is like imparts momentum imparts energy uh, to the nucleus but yeah when we when we talk about collisions in physics right the word collision brushes over the fact that in the real world when we call collisions always involve some sort of fundamental force on the atomic or subatomic level now let me ask how lz compares two detectors that came before it uh, because i i know there there were a few when i was reading through the paper it looks like there were several experiments that came before this lz seemed to be bigger and more accurate right that's correct so it's bigger and better the bigger part is easy the better requires a couple more detail of course the bigger is simply due to the fact that if you don't find dark matter it, 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 it can mean one of two things. Now, despite what I said earlier about mountains of evidence, of course, we have to be humble. Maybe we're still wrong and there is no dark matter. I think it's unlikely, but we must be humble. However, another possibility is that the probability of interaction is even lower than you thought. And so you need to give the dark matter a bigger target. And so dark matter detectors are always getting bigger, 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 bigger. They're still very, very small and very cost effective compared to many other you know, types of particle physics. But nevertheless, we still have to go bigger, bigger, bigger. Because if you think about dark matter as darts and you didn't find the darts, maybe you need a bigger dartboard. And so we keep building bigger and bigger experiments. However, it would be crazy to just build a bigger experiment and not also make it better, right? Lessons learned. And so it's not only bigger, but we also took lessons from the previous experiment. So Lux Zeppelin, like the name says, is actually a merger between two previous competitors have merged and become one, the Lux experiment and the Zeppelin experiment. And so Zeppelin experiment was mostly a uh, UK and Portuguese experiment, but now the UK and Portugal have joined with the United States and they're on LZ. And so LZ is a joint effort putting the best minds and expertise together from multiple countries. So not just dozens of universities and labs, but also multiple uh, countries that come together. And so one of the improvements on LZ versus its predecessors like Lux is it's also a multi-layer detector. And that's very important. That means that if something interacts in the, in the heart of the detector, 
but doesn't interact in one of the outer layers, then it's more likely to be dark matter, which interacts rarely, as we said, versus a neutron or a gamma ray or some other particle that we already know and love, you know? And so this, this onion-like structure is new, is one of the main things that makes LZ not just bigger, but also better. Okay, so that's different than something like a neutrino detector, which I, I've seen photos of those. It's basically, it's a giant pool of water with uh, like photo detectors around it, right? That's right? So this sounds like it's a very different setup experimentally. C correct. Well, I wouldn't say very different, but yeah, it's not monolithic. It used to be more like the neutrino experiments. It used to be monolithic, but like, like you were just saying, just one giant tank of one substance, uh, water in the case of the neutrino experiments and xenon in the case of Mm -hmm. um, of LZ, but but now it's not the case anymore of just the one monolithic thing. That one monolithic thing is still the most important part of the experiment. It's the heart of the detector. But now, almost as important, equally as important, are those outer layers of different liquids that have different interactions with neutrinos, gammas, alphas, betas, different muons, different particles. That helps us differentiate because dark matter, if it interacts so rarely it's not gonna scatter two or three times. So if something scatters at the same time in two or three detector layers, uh, you know that was in dark matter, so you can throw that out. So that's incredibly powerful. And it's one of the, the beautiful new things that, that's new with LZ and with the current generation of dark matter experiments that are all around the world competing uh, with LZ. Well, you know, I, and actually that was further down in my questions, but I should probably mention that now. So it looks like, and again, this comes back to the rare event searches. It looks like this can detect not only dark matter, but it can also detect neutrinos. And there, there were some other types of interactions that it can detect, right? So it sounds like you can do more than one type of science experiment with this. Is that accurate? That's absolutely correct. That used to not be the case when the dark matter experiments were smaller, but now they're getting so big like LZ where we can do multiple different kinds of physics. And that's really, really powerful because remember what I said earlier that despite the mountains of evidence, we have to be humble. What if dark matter is not there or it's there, but maybe it's not findable with this technique. I mean, I would still say it's a small possibility, but it's a possibility. And so that's why it's so wonderful that even though dark matter remains, you know, like more than 60, 70, I'd say 80% of our effort, the main thing is dark matter. But the thing is, we can also do so much other physics. We can do um, lots of neutrino physics, the solar neutrinos, uh, neutrinos double beta decay. Um, there, there, there are other things we can do. Supernovas. If a supernova goes off in our galaxy, right? The last one was uh, 1987A. So in 1987, we were lucky. There weren't many dark matter experiments, but there were neutrino experiments that were running and saw those supernova neutrinos. And so it's really wonderful as if a supernova goes off while LZ is running, that's another completely different kind of physics is looking at the neutrinos and that supernova explosion that's completely unrelated to dark matter. It's beautiful astrophysics on its own. It teaches us how stars die. So that's a great example of the different kind of physics you can do with this experiment. So it is primarily about dark matter, but not 100% about dark matter. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the search results for this that run with an exposure time of 60 days led to a profile likelihood ratio analysis that showed the data to be consistent with the background only hypothesis. That's kind of a mouthful. But so I'm wondering, could you explain that to the audience a little bit? Yep. In English, it means we didn't find dark matter yet. That's all okay. That's, that's all. What it means. Yeah, that's a fancy way of saying that. So the but the experience, so it sounds like all oh, the experiment was a failure, but no, because it might take us a really long time. If you look at other kinds of physics, chemistry, other kinds of science, sometimes it takes decades of trying to find something if it's really hard. So a great example of that is gravitational waves. It took us decades to find it, and it took us literally, it was 99 or maybe it was exactly 100 or close to 100 years from when Albert Einstein first mentioned gravitational waves and, and wrote a paper and, and, and predicted they might, they might exist. So these things take time. So, so, so LZ is a, it may not have found dark matter yet, but it's still a success in the sense that the experiment took years to build hundreds of people and is working properly. I mean, we were 
almost sure we were not going to find dark matter in the first run because what often happens with these dark matter experiments is our competitors are so close behind us that we want to publish a result you know that's just a little bit better than theirs you know what i mean so we don't run as long as the maximum time so we only run ran for 60 days and we're planning on running for as long as a thousand days or longer and and so 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 the so the this is just a preliminary uh result um and so yeah that sentence just means we didn't find dark matter yet <laughs> yet yeah well yeah. It, you know one of the things that was interesting also and again this was in the paper was there was a lot of attention to detail and that's a, a, a wonderful thing in removing bias from the search results that was an entire section of the paper and so basically data was trimmed that might have been affected by nearby electronics multi-scatter interactions events outside the energy region of interest and, and uh, there were a lot more there was again a, a giant list of potential biases. Does the sensitivity of this detector make it prone to more noise? And what kind of error margins is your team able to work with? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, very deep question. So we have, as we build bigger and bigger detectors, it's both a blessing and a curse. So as we build a bigger detector, it's a bigger target for dark matter. But that means it's a bigger target for everything else. But some of the way to mitigate that is what's beautiful about the, the, me, the detector medium we use liquid xenon is that it's self-shielding because it's a big atom and it has a large density. Liquid xenon is dense, almost three times denser than liquid water. And, it, it, and the xenon atom itself has a lot of protons and neutrons. So you combine those, those two facts. And what happens is, is you can trim from your analysis, the outermost edges of the detector in physical space, like in three dimensions, mm. because that's where most of the other particles will be. Neutrons, gammas, they're going to preferentially interact in the first few centimeters or inches of the liquid xenon. And so you can, if you trim the outermost edges, that's called, that's what we call fiducialization. You trim the outermost edges. That's really effective at getting you back to a, 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 a big enough volume of xenon you can use and to still have a, a sensitive experiment. Okay, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, one of the graphs in this showed what they call a 90% confidence limit for spin independent WIMP cross section versus WIMP mass. It, what interested me about that graph was it showed the LZ detector versus the Panda X4T, the Xenon 1T, and the Deep 3600 detectors. And the curves lined up very well. So, does that comparison of the LZ results versus the older exper experiments, does that help to validate the detector in terms of accuracy and quality and you know, all of the things that go into it? That's right. So we do have co competitors and competing experiments, but competition is important and healthy because if someone makes a detection right now, it's just exclusion limits, those curves you referred to. So we're just, we're still measuring zero, you know, with increasingly lower, lower values. But what if someone was to make a discovery? You can't claim a discovery of something like dark matter if it's not checked by somebody else right with a similar or a different technology and that's how science works is reproducibility so okay. it's absolutely critical that there are different but similar experiments out there but one thing i have to point out they're not actually that close together if you look at so actually the curves especially deep 3600 is pretty far away so if you look at the y-axis it's actually logarithmic so the tick marks are actually 10 times apart. And so what, what those tick marks mean in that graph is 10 times more probability for the dark matter interact. So if you go up two tick marks on, on the left hand on the y-axis, that's 100 times. It's like the Richter scale for earthquakes. It's, it's a logarithmic plot. And, and so that's actually, there's a vast difference between those curves. I mean, they're similar in shape because all our technologies are so similar. So they're similar in shape, but actually LZ is considerably lower right now. Yeah, I'm, of course our competitors, are, they're gonna catch up, of course, because we're all you know racing, but right now LZ has the lowest curve by a significant margin. Mm, okay, okay. And, and that does make sense. I did notice that. It looks like LZ is 
much more sensitive, right? But yeah, yeah the, the curves do match up. And that, that was the part that intrigued me. I thought maybe, again, that helps to validate the detector. It does, it does. Right? But not quite yet, because right now, LZ is so far ahead that, yeah, it, but, but again, Xenon and Panda X, that's the Europeans and the primarily Europeans and the Chinese experiments. Um, they're, of course, I'm sure they're all good scientists, good people. They, they'll, be, they'll be catching up. But since I'm on LZ, I hope they don't catch up too soon, right? <laughs> well, so is there a level of detector sensitivity that would finally definitively end the uncertainty about whether dark matter exists or not? Or does that rely on the amount of work rather than the sensitivity of the instrumentation? Um, before I answer, I wasn't clear on one thing on your question, you mean amount of work. I wasn't clear what, what, what you meant by that. Well, I, I guess it kind of, you know, when I was, when I was going through the paper, I, it's, it's becoming more and more technologically advanced, right? But the, the technology is only one component of that. The science is done on top of the results. And so, you know, like I, I know with particle accelerators, it's always like, okay, if we double the size, then we can quadruple the power and we'll finally ah. find this, pink, you know? But but then I, I thought, well, with dark matter, maybe maybe that's not part of it. Maybe the maybe it comes down to having enough data and then just time to do the science, you know? That's oh, I see. So it's kind of like it's like the difference between basically physics and engineering. If I engineer it better, can I just keep going? Yeah, yeah. Or, or would it make a difference past a certain point? Or does it come down to the the, the answer is both. So first we can keep going for about another 10 or 20 years, at least, maybe a little bit more, just by improving the technology. But then in a, couple, in a decade or two, there's going to come a point where the technological improvement is not going to help as much. And that happens when we hit something called the neutrino fog. And it's that colored in region at the bottom of the graph. That's called the neutrino fog. And what happens there is you build your experiment so big that now your dark matter detector is, an ex is a great neutrino detector. And unfortunately, one person's signal is another person's background noise, right? And so what happens is that eventually you have so many neutrino interactions, first from the sun or from supernova neutrino backgrounds, things like that, where even if dark matter is real and exists and it's there, you may never find it because it's going to be buried under that neutrino signal now that's even if you could differentiate those two and we have clever ideas still there comes a point where there's just so many neutrino events we're not there yet though we can keep improving the technology right now we can get better photon detection efficiencies and things like that we can keep pushing but there's going to come a point where we can't push down any further because we're bogged down in the neutrino fog and eventually we can't push to the left any further, lowering our threshold energy, our energy threshold. So there, there are some technological limitations, but then eventually what's gonna happen is not, it's not gonna be a technological limitation. Eventually it's probably gonna be the physical limitation. Now, to answer your question of like, can we then definitively say something? No, unfortunately, because what could happen is dark matter may be real, but it may interact only gravitationally or it interacts non-gravitationally, but so rarely that we'll never find it because it'll, it's buried too deep in the neutrino fog. So, so there, there may be, that would be really sad if that happened. We may come to a point where, where all we will ever have is the gravitational evidence for dark matter and the cosmological, and, and one could always try to poke holes in that and we'll, we will not have a laboratory detection. That's definitely possible. And we have to be humble as scientists and admit that's a possibility. It's a scary possibility. But yeah, we'll never have a definitive, we can have a definitive discovery, but we, it'll be hard to have a definitive, definitive ruling out because it's very hard to prove a negative. You know, what I mean, it's kind of like Bigfoot or UFOs or the Loch Ness Monster, because one could always come back and say, ah, well, you didn't look hard enough. You know yeah. what I mean? And so it's really hard to prove a negative. And it's very intellectually not satisfying, definitely. Like, we hope we don't come to that point. It would be really nice to find dark matter, because if we don't, we, it may it may always live as, as, as a, a, a it, all, it may always continue as, as a theory because of the mountains of evidence we have from astronomy. But it would be so frustrating if we couldn't close the loop on that evidence with evidence from particle physics with a detector like LZ. 
Yeah, well, but in the meantime, you guys are amortizing out the cost of the detector by the other particle rare event searches. And I, again, I think that's one of the things that makes it so wonderful, right? Is it's right, not yeah. just looking for that one thing. You guys were able to take that cost and break it down across a wide range of scientific experiments. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. And some of them are, 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 are more certain than others, like neutrinos, double beta K, we're pretty sure that's a rare nuclear process. But um, one could argue that it's equally or more probable to exist than dark matter. So there's all these other exotic physics that, that we can look for. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. also non-discovery is just as valuable as discovery. Um, one of the most famous experiments in physics, uh, uh, late, late, I think late 1890s or early 1900s is the Michelson-Morley experiment where they failed to prove that ether exists, right? And it turned out that was really important. And they accidentally had the first evidence of Einstein's theory of special relativity. So sometimes a, a, a null result, not finding something, is equally important, if not more important, than finding the thing you originally set out to find. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Matthew, let me thank you again for your time. And you know, before we close, let me ask, what comes next for your work with the LZ detector? Is, is this something, again, you've mentioned a thousand day run, and are, are you, is your team already looking at this and potentially planning a successor based on what you've learned so far? Yes, so the current plan is to do at least a thousand day run. If we can continue um, to get uh, uh, government funding, we would want to continue past that because we have a beautiful, large and working detector. So we would absolutely love to run for even longer than that, but currently the plan is at least a bare minimum of 1,000 live days. Um, and, but that's not the end of the story because then what we wanna do is build an even larger scale experiment, even if we, regardless of what the result of LZ, because if we don't find dark matter, we wanna build a larger experiment um, to keep looking. If we do find dark matter, then we want to do what people did with neutrinos, right? We want to characterize the dark matter, right? Characterize the properties of the dark matter. So that's so so the so right now we're actually talking to our competitors, and we've already established a rapport with them with the xenon and, and Darwin experiments, actually, and we formed a new collabor a temporary consortium called XLZD that is you know through in the letters from xenon and darwin and lz and also you know we love the comic strip xkcd and we we're trying to plan on uh, securing funding to build a third generation experiment so you can think of like experiments like lux is like sort of first generation and then lz is a second generation and we want to build a third generation experiment where where we we bring together multiple people currently working on generation two projects like LZ or, or Xenon and build an experiment that that is going to be as close to definitive as we can get in terms of going down to the neutrino bomb. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, these are all wonderful things to see. Matthew, thank you for the update. And thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome.